Hello and welcome to the event tonight. My name is Astrid Edwards and I am your host. I would like to welcome to the stage Wondery Man Colin Hunter IV for a welcome to country. Thank you very much and good evening ladies and gentlemen. It is my honour and privilege to be here today. My name is Colin Hunter IV. I would like to start off with acknowledging that this evening we are on Wurundjeri country, home of my ancestors and also home to everybody here today. I wish to pay my respects to both elders past, present and emerging, elders from all nations, especially all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community members here this evening. Wurundjeri is a part of the Kulin Nation and of the Warung language group. Wurundjeri country extends from the inner city of Melbourne across to the Great Dividing Range, west to the Werribee River, south to the Mordialic Creek and east to Mount Borbore. A big thank you to everybody who has helped make this event possible this evening. Woman Jekka, welcome and I hope everyone has a fantastic evening ahead. Thank you very much and enjoy. It is a pleasure to be here tonight with Anne Enright. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. Before we get into our discussion with Anne, we have a little bit of housekeeping. I will get through this as quickly as possible. Um, we will have questions from the audience tonight. Uh, they will not be with their traditional roving mic. There is... Um, where are they? There is um, something for you to scan, uh, and then you're able to message in your questions, which will um, appear, to, uh, appear for me here. Um, this event is also being recorded uh, as a video. Uh, if you enjoy the conversation tonight, please share it once it is released with your friends. Um, and also a reminder, if you haven't already turned off your phone, please do, um, so as not to interrupt Anne. I would like to welcome State Library of Victoria donors, the Foundation Council members, Redmond Barry Society members, members of the Library's board, and also everybody who is here tonight uh, to welcome Anne to Melbourne. Now, Anne, I know it is very awkward to sit in front of a room full of people and have someone read your bio. I am going to do this very briefly, because I'm sure you already know what I'm about to say. As you know, Anne has published short story collections and non-fiction, as well as many, many novels, including The Gathering, which won the Man Booker Prize in, 20, uh, uh, in 2007, and also The Wren, The Wren, which we will uh, speak about tonight. Anne, in 2015, was appointed the first laureate of Irish fiction, and I do have questions about that. And also, in 2018, um, Anne received the Irish Pen Award for Outstanding Contribution to Literature. That is quite the resume. Is it fair for me to say that we don't normally get to speak with many Booker Prize winners in Australia? Yes. It is. Uh, mm, mm. So thank you. Don't you have a few yourself, though? I mean, <laughs> aren't there a number of Australians? Yes. There are a number of Australians who have won the Booker Prize. Um, there are five Australians, um, all male. No female uh, has... Uh, from Australia has won the Booker Prize yet. And, and you have just been at Adelaide uh, Writers Week and the Adelaide Festival. I do hope you enjoyed Adelaide. And I was told that whilst there, you got a question from the audience about the domination or the dominance of male voices in Irish literature. And before we dive into the Wren, as a Booker Prize winner sitting in front of a very um, uh, lovely audience, could you speak to maybe your thoughts of what we used to think of as the canon and how we are changing that? Yeah, I mean, one thing about it is it depends on who you're talking to, right? Uh, somebody might say, aren't Irish uh, writers, you know, so many great male Irish writers, fair are the women? And others will say, my goodness, the women have just been kicking it out of the park for the last while. Um, uh, and so, it, it, so the canon is self-selecting in an odd kind of way. I do remember being in an Airbnb in Iceland, in Reykjavik, 
and there were books there, and there were all a comprehensive list of Irish books, and they were all by men. And I wanted to leave a note for the host, and my husband was saying, "No, don't, don't, don't leave a note for the host." And I'm like, "Why not?" And I was like, "This is my life's work." Um, but there were no books by women on on those shelves from any space. So there is a, a, a thing that still functions, usually in male minds, where they can't, won't, uh, don't like, uh, are disempowered by, feel stupid when uh, reading women, are worried about being seen reading women. I used to have a thing called the nephew test. My nephew, who's now well grown, looked at the cover of a book called Eliza Lynch, who's 23 years old maybe, and he said no man would be seen with that book on the train. <laughs> so, um, but that, that was very often the cover with, uh, the, the, the case with uh, the covers for female women's books. So every cover since then goes through the nephew test. <laughs> uh, I send it to Shane, I say, what do you think? He goes, yeah, yeah, I, I, could, I could read that on the, <laughs> on, on the dart. <laughs> That'd be fine. But he was, he's a young, younger generation, so he'd say, you know, what do you think of the latest Barbara King solver or something? He just didn't have it in his, he didn't have it in his formation. So, um, and it was fairly natural and automatic to him to read women's fiction as, as well as men's. So I do, I do think it may be also age related. But you, you find when somebody wants to sound important, they will sound important in man. <laughs> you know, they'll reach, they'll do a man important. Um, so it's a sign of insecurity, really. And we should be working at clearing that up for them. Absolutely. I have a feeling many of us in the room are going to quote um, uh, what you just said, and thank you. Now, tonight we are here, of course, to talk about the Wren, the Wren, Anne's most recent novel. I have to say it has a beautiful cover, hopefully past the nephew test. In order to introduce this work to us, Anne has agreed to do a very short reading to oh, uh, yes. open up um, the Which main bit? characters. Well, I read the poem. Oh, well, I would read the, the, the rude bit, and uh, the annoying bit. I mean, there's plenty of rude bits in the book, but, uh, but maybe we'll, I'll read the poem to, to set a lyrical tone. Um, this is uh, The Wren, The Wren for Carmel. It's Phil McDowell's poem for, on the birth of his daughter. Berry, glance, leaf twisting into bird, high-tailed from hedge to hand, she was mine. The wren poked out from the cup of my fist and was still, her eye honour bright to my vast eye, the whir of her pulse ecstatic. The wren, the wren was a panic of feathered air in my opening hand, so fierce and light I did not feel the push of her ascent away from me, in a blur of love to love indistinguishable my palm pin-pricked, my earth-bound heart of her love's weight relieved, and oh, my life, my daughter, the faraway sky is cold and very blue. So that's Phil at his most sentimental. Um. Thank you, Anne. Phil is the grandfather, Carmel is his daughter, and Nell is his granddaughter, and they are the three central characters of the Wren. What drove you to write this particular story at this moment in time? Well, I mean, the poetry came during the first weeks of lockdown when I was, um, you know, in that spring, it was spring in Ireland of April 2020, and I just had a book called Actress Out, and it, it, it was just sliced. <laughs> by the shutter of the lockdown coming down on its publication. I was in uh, America when everything fell apart. I had to get the last plane home. Uh, and the book, the shops closed and the world stopped. And I went for a long, as long as we were allowed, walks up the local hill, which looked out over Dublin um, and got very kind of obsessively, slightly ecstatically interested in the spring, the budding of 
the, 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 amazing, the amazing thing of the world keeping going as the lives all stopped, the sense of dread. And when I went home, I read poetry because reading novels, was, there was no sense to it. I mean, novels are, are so, they need society. They, they need a society and society had gone. Also, you spend an awful lot of time being semi-obliged to read new fiction or the new thing or find out what's going on now and nothing was going on now. So it removed the sense of the market, it removed the sense of the readership and it made me feel like I was 16 again. It made me feel like a young writer who had no readers, uh, who was alone, like nice, wonderfully alone in some way in a, in a space of great significance and so I read poetry. What else are you going to do? What else are you going to do when you feel like that? So I, I, I reached for not, uh, not the, I reached for uh, medieval Irish lyrics in our medieval Irish poetry, the way you do. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of su surprised myself. Um, but there's a book of uh, parallel translations by Tom Kinsler called Amdun, or Poems of the Dispossessed. And there were two poems in there of birds. One was a blackbird, that a, a, a pet blackbird, a lament for a lady's pet blackbird, or saying, don't cry for the dead blackbird, 17th, 16th century, like a kind of troubadour poem. And one was a lament for a dead bird who uh, had died of thirst because the lake had frozen over and it's called the Yellow Bittern and it's their famous drinking poem to, to those who, who know their Irish poetry. And these two dead birds were there in the middle, you know, death stalking the, the globe. These two tiny mortalities coming back so fresh on the page after uh, hundreds of years and I was immensely struck by that. The tiny, the tiny hits are the tiny hits of what makes the book, you know, or makes, stirs a book. I, it, it was only after I finished that I realized that I'd started the gathering with it, the, the body of a dead bird weathering against a wall, so it clearly means something to me that I don't quite understand. Um, yeah, so there's Phil. I was, when I started writing Phil's poems, and I, I don't really have a timeline on it, partly because lockdown removed our sense of chronology, but also in that kind of intuitive dreaminess of writing a book. You don't really know where you are. Some, um, but I was writing as Phil for a while and I really enjoyed it. That Wren poem uh, is closer to me uh, than it is, than the rest of Phil's work is. So Phil is, uh, he's, you know, um, passed away when most of the action um, He's dead, happens. he's very dead. <laughs> he's very, he's very dead. dead, he's a dead poet. I mean, they may name movies after them, don't they? He's a, he's a dead poet, and, it's, and him being dead is, is important to his being a poet as well. Mm. He's dead, uh, <laughs> but his daughter, Carmel, and granddaughter, Nell, are very much alive. And, you know, this book is... Um, we re experienced this book from Carmel and Nell's... Um, uh, through their life. And I would like to um, ask you, as a writer, in lockdown, where everything and anything goes, what was it like to explore the two different women who are obviously a different generation, but the narrative yeah. itself goes into the differences between the generations? So I, I was coming down from the hill and I was writing Carmel, who is a, a chick who rolls up her sleeves and gets on with it, as we were also doing. Yeah. Um, and I was a bit troubled by what I was going to do with Carmel. She kind of annoyed me a little bit. <laughs> I didn't know where she was going to go. Uh, she's, she's the kind of woman who is self-limiting. Um, uh, and she had suffered a kind of terrible rupture when Phil, her father, left her as uh, her family when she was 12. So she, she's a kind of, and I was intrigued, I'd never written a character like this before, somebody who won't, okay? So she's a kind of refuser, so she, she doesn't, Nell says of her mother that her mother doesn't believe in problems because a problem is a sign that you've got too much imagination. So it means that you've imagined it and therefore you deserve to have a problem. She's talking about you know, intolerances or allergies or whatever. She says if, if you're gro groping for the EpiPen, she might believe there's something wrong with you. <laughs> but up to that, it's all your imagination and you deserve to feel bad because you made it up. So. That strikes, I think, a chord of recognition in a lot of audiences. Yeah. Yeah. 
It, uh, uh, as perhaps a kind of maternal voice in there somewhere, um, or an aunt or something. <laughs> the woman who isn't sympathetic, um, or, or the, you know, all of that. And, we're, and we are all that too ourselves sometimes. Um, and so I didn't know where she was going to go until she, she got pregnant. And she didn't get pregnant until about a year into the writing. And once I realized I could do that. <laughs> then I knew it was going to be a problem. Yeah. The pregnancy? No. Uh, once I knew that she would fall in love, which she does. I mean, absolutely and utterly loves this child. I knew she was going to fuck it up. And then I knew, <laughs> I knew that that would be the book. So I mean, I knew, or think she had, as all mothers perhaps do. There's a really sad passage where she says she has not been a good mother. Despite her daughter saying that she has been, or, you know, or not thinking that. So, I mean, I think that's a kind of existential tragedy, really. I think that's, that, goes, that goes, with the, goes with the job description. Mm. A sense of failure, but... Spoiler alert, Nell, t Nell turns out okay. Yes, she does. She, she does have a lot of um, confronting experiences, uh, poor relationships, bad relationships. Now, some of you have already started to send questions through, uh, and I can see one that's relatively similar to what I was going to ask as well, and that is about Nell's relationship that you go into in quite a bit of detail with um, a man called Phelan. And... It's too much detail, too much, too much. No, it's too much, <laughs> possibly. Yeah, go on, what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, what are the ethics of kind of, as a writer, as a creator, putting that kind of horrible thing on the page? What are the ethics? Oh yeah. my God. Big one for you. That is a huge question. Mm. Uh, proceed with caution, I think. Uh, uh, um, um, what, what do you think the ethical ramifications are? I, I might answer one, preempt you by saying, um, so uh, I've been reading a lot of younger women, um, and I've been writing reviews about women who are interested in damage and interested in how that damage might be sexualized, and interested in masochism and submission and all these kind of things. And, so I had written for the New York Review of Books about you know, uh, the idea of doing something wrong and having mm. that, that the, the kind of transgressive or interested, interested in the wrongness of it, uh, especially for very conscientious women who are doing everything right. Mm. Um, so I had been looking at these texts and I was kind of thinking uh, that that wasn't how my feminism came of age. I thought in the you know, late 70s we were going to throw off the shackles of sexual repression, everyone was going to have a really good time. We weren't going to say, you know, uh, the things that I was, you know, uh, we, you, and, and the question is, how much of it is social, how much of it is, where does it come from? The internet is behind that relationship uh, very much. Um, it also concerns, it also contains the parental anxiety of, oh my God, what are our children doing? which I thought that the, the, the readers would really hang mm. on to uh, of, of, of all generations. So, but one of the, 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 reader, the books I'd read was Megan Nolan, who's a younger Irish writer. She wrote Acts of Desperation, and it was about being enthralled to a really unpleasant guy. Um, and she said, she, she did an interview with me, and she said she got, she, she got quite fussed by the feedback. She said, it's not as though I was trying to glamorize it. And so I think that is where the yeah. ethics of it are. I, I share perhaps a reader's distaste for people who are trying to make themselves seem more attractive <laughs> by glamorizing damage. Mm. And it's a certain phase that people can go through, uh, a mode of dress, uh, you know, a kind of online um, clubbing together as well. But, and I'm not an expert, I'm very far from an expert, but you kind of think that French women writers like Marguerite Dura have been doing that forever. Um, 
and perhaps that's something to do with the patriarchal thing in, in French culture. Um, now, I don't want to get into trouble with all of France. It's okay, I, you're in Australia. I can't back that up. Uh, but you go, if you go into the history of French, I mean, if you go into older French cinema, films like Betty Blue or whatever, mm. there's plenty of images, sexualized images of damage and distress um, that are not seen as pornographic, but that might be ethically a, a little bit too interesting. Mm. But um, what, what is your question then? That was a great answer. Uh, and the specific question from the audience, I think that you have um, ans uh, answered it, but really, um, uh, you know, uh, why did Nell want to be humiliated by Phelim? And I think that you've kind of gone there. I don't know if she wanted it. Um, I suppose, yeah, uh, um, you know, you kind of want to me feel s strategic. It's not like Nell got dressed in the morning and said, now how can I go out there and be humiliated, okay? But when he started humiliating her, um, he did, it wasn't. He didn't start by humiliating her. Uh, he the, the relationship contained the kind of intermittent satisfactions that relationships always have at that age. The question: When is he going to ring? I mean, that has been going. Around, that's been a question. Surely, since the 1950s, if not since the 1890s or whatever, when is he going to ring? So I was interested in that crush moment of that thrall moment of when is of, of high dependency, whatever that is. There is a word for it. Limerence, is that the word? No? Hmm? That's mutual. Okay, we have we have uh, We have an expert <laughs> experts there. So yeah, the uh, I suppose the, the projections, the idealizations. She's not looking for a monster. He's he's he She's, she's, she's very interested in his size, in, in the power, in his mm. powerfulness, physic, how physically powerful he is. There's a, one a, a sentence that I thought, oh, that's really skating the edge, where she says, if I didn't want this, I wouldn't be able to stop it, and that's kind of interesting. Um, but uh, that his size is kind of, you know, mm. interesting to her. But I actually, you know, I shouldn't be drawing attention to these things. Uh, it's not, it's always consensual. Absolutely, Nell um, participates um, uh, once more, is waiting for you know, the call or the text or whatnot. Nell exists um, very much online. Her, her job is online. She, you know, um, uh, therefore doesn't have to go into an office or anything. She can often be quite um, alone. She's apart totally from alone. Yeah. When she's, you know, engaging online, whether it's through a kind of a remote relationship or anything else she's doing online. And um, I did want to ask about the exploration of kind of the different ways, um, you know, the two women of different generations kind of experience. Um, the bad things that happened to them, or the negative relationships that you know, kind of passed down from Phil, the the father of Carmel, the grandfather of Nell. They're not that happy necessarily in many of their interactions with men. With or men, yeah. No, I, I was reading a review um, which said the men are all kind of terrible in my work, and I'm thinking, well, the women aren't that much better. <laughs> it's like it's not a competition, but but you write from their point of view, so oh, we so like it's them very all. much from their point of view. And the the key thing is that Phil left. So, so the, the masculinity in the book will always be disappointing, you know, unless it's too interesting, I suppose. So um, Carmel gets a boyfriend, and I think he's fine. Uh, I think he's absolutely fine. Carmel can't get there. In fact, she has a kind of interesting response. It's a little bit like Phil's response back in the day to uh, when he has a problem, she can't do his problems. And it was my husband who said, oh my God, she's doing exactly the same as her father did. Because mm. I, I don't actually know that on some, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the time I'm kind of exploring their characters in a way that's so intuitive that I don't necessarily see the patterns. And when I do see the patterns, sometimes when they're pointed out to me, I can then lift them and brighten them and, you know, rin rinse, rinse around them to, so that they become more clear. Not too clear. I would like to kind of go back to Phil and his um, The Dead Poet, very dead, um, very famous. Um, movies might be made of him. And he, how he's famous in Ireland, which isn't that famous, okay? <laughs> and how his influence, including that fame, 
um, you know, is um, influences uh, his two daughters, his granddaughter, because they can't really escape his shadow. Um, you know, Nell looks a bit like him. Occasionally, they have to turn up at literary events and, and say something nice about, you know, um, the old dead poet. His shadow remains. And I wanted to ask about this in terms of the story that I hope you all um, have read or will read soon, but also, um, if I can be bold here, and in terms of your status in, in Irish literature, you are a woman and you have created a, a dead male Irish poet that you kind of poke fun at. Oh, yeah, no, I do, yeah. <laughs> well, a little bit, but the business of reputation becomes very dated. So I'm interested in the datedness of it. So that in the, say, uh, and I, it, it, Phil feels a little bit older than, in fact, the timeline. You know, he feels like the 50s, he feels like not the 60s, he feels like the old days. Um, um, and it's intriguing to me how that becomes dated. So he's slightly out of fashion now. I mean, Carmel looks around at his funeral and says he, she wants to ask the president sends his aide de camp, which is a number of people who said to me, oh, the aide de camp was at my, yeah, my uncle's funeral or whatever the president sends. It's somebody in uniform now, uh, can be male or female, but used to be a man in uniform with the hat. And, the, and she wants to say, she wants to ask him, do you think he was any good? Like, somebody here, <coughs> tell me, was he any good? Because her friends don't think he's any good. They, you know, they think she, he's just an example of something. So he was an example of something that was lionised in Irish letters and seen as necessary to Irish letters, which was the, the lyric. I mean, Ireland defaults always to the lyric um, and, um, and to a kind of ennobling uh, view of poverty, I think. Mm -hmm. Just to... Just not to, you know, that, that he makes the rural uh, poverty seem beautiful. And that's, that's a job. Somebody should do it. But it was, uh, I mean, it was very much part of the Irish literary revival and, and, and the growth of nationalism. And a little bit onerous to me as a middle class girl growing up in Dublin because it always involved loveliness in women and it was very male. Phil had lots of women, and as the novel progresses, we learn a bit more about um, them. Not in any detail, but by the end of it, you kind of realise there might have been a lot. And when he leaves, he marries someone else, an American. And I want to talk about the American woman. Oh, and, do you? And, and, and no one has talked about Connie. I oh, like Connie. Oh, really? No, I like yeah. Connie. Uh, yeah. It's exciting when Connie turns up and she writes this letter yes. to Nell. Would you maybe read it? Oh, or can we just well, talk it's about quite it? a moment. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, Connie is um, she's kind of a woman who moves on rollers. <laughs> she moves on rollers. She's very smooth. She's she's really polite. She's from a kind of Puritan American background. She's very thoroughgoing and very moral. But when she was twenty-one, she ran off with an Irish poet. But she, yeah, <laughs> it, it made sense. So this is many years later. Dear Nell, what an absolute joy to hear from you. Many thanks for being in touch. I wish I could answer your questions, but it's such a long time ago. I was 21 when I married your grandfather, which sounds outrageous. It was, that was the whole point. And I suppose you might say the relationship played out by the rules of the time. As I get older, I feel like all that happened, not just in a different world, but to a different person. There are times when I don't recognize myself there. I still feel that the guardianship of Phil's gift was the best of the relationship for me. There is a moral pleasure to be found in the encouragement of beautiful work. And it continues to be my great honor to foster talent where I can. I would love to host you here in Sag Harbor as a member of the family at the main house if you want to apply for artist in residence in the stable yard. The process is overseen by an independent board and the application form is on the website, which you have already found. I don't know if you've heard about our new initiative, this is the Selma Karras Award Scheme. One of uh, his, Phil's girlfriend was very, very anguished and a bit mad. Uh, this is the Selma Karras Award Scheme for young female artists. He was known for throwing her out on, her street, on the street in, in her nightie, by the way, which I do know somebody who is known for that, a, a poet in Ireland. He's always throwing his wives out into the street in their nighties. Uh, <laughs> 
I don't know if you've heard about our new initiative. This is the Selma Carras Award Scheme for Young Female Artists, which especially welcomes work on mental health, broadly interpreted. <laughs> Selma lived for, for a while with her grandfather in Greece, and as you may know, her work is increasingly valued, not just here in the States, but also worldwide. Selma is a very secluded person who sadly has not published in some decades. You should read her early work. I feel you would see what Phil saw when he said she was the most exciting poet he knew. You will find the turbulence of their relationship echoing through her poetry and also in a few rare glimpses through his. I don't know if there was, as she claims, a professional ri rivalry there. He was an established figure, after all, she an unpublished ingenue. With lesser mortals, I include myself in this, your grandfather was never cruel, but they had a different dynamic, and he treated her very poorly, as she now says publicly, and I believe. We who loved Phil knew on some level that we loved him not despite, but because of his badness. In those days, that was quite the thing. It loosed something in our psyches, I think, which was not always a force for good. This is why I set up the Caris Bursary Scheme. I cannot absolve myself completely of Phil's poor behaviour. I adored him, certainly for the first while, and this may have contributed to his slightly distorted sense of himself. I thought I had no choice but to adore him, but of course I did have a choice. That goes without saying. Will I keep going? I, I, I would not swap places with the young woman I once was who loved Phil McDara. The changes since then in the world and in me as a person have been so welcome and right. But I continue to be fond of his poems, as I hope are you. They are not quite as thrilling as the truths to be found in Caris, who confronted what Phil was at such pains to hide. Her work is an exploration of damage, his an escape from it. Even so, his attempt to go free fills me with compassion. When I read him now, I wonder if you can know too much. But you are young and I feel you are talented. The world is surely for you a better place. Dear Nell, I have thought deeply in all this over the years and I'm happy to stand by whatever I have to say, but this letter is for you, not for everyone. I trust your voice, it seems so honest and resolute. I remember you as a direct, clear-eyed little girl who missed nothing and who laughed easily. I cannot wait to meet you in person again. Bear Bua, as Phil used to say, we make the future word by word and line by line and brick by small brick. With love from your granny, Connie. <laughs> Thank you for reading that. There is so much in that passage for the reader. Um, it brings together uh, so many threads. And I mean, essentially, we have Connie, who is now, you know, the guardian of his literary estate, but also kind of looking back and maybe reevaluating, and has started something, a new creative thing, in the name of one of the women that he probably hurt really badly and damaged significantly and maybe ended her career. Well, you know. She, she, Selma Karras was probably in it for the damage as well. <laughs> Maybe, but still. Yeah, but you don't have to be the one who does it. That is true. You know. Well, I have a question. Is that me. a very contentious thing to say? No, it's okay, no. but I'm going to um, follow that up with a question from the audience, um, which seems an appropriate one to ask here. Um, an anonymous says, um, violence seems to be at the heart of the Wren. How does the violence between women differ from the violence inflicted on women by men. Yeah, no, unfortunately, um, the, the, there is a lot of violence in the book and there is some animal, animal cruelty in the book. And, and violence is seen differently through the different generations, whether it's a kind of domestic argy-bargy or ordinary, what seem to be ordinary domestic uh, discipline or sense here in Phil's youth turns into a kind of, not a comedy, but just a kind of, uh, ordinary kind of thing in Carmel's youth and then becomes much more uh, difficult and interesting and truthful, I think, uh, in, in, in to as we move towards the present day. But the, the book is a lot about the dead poet has an inheritance and the, the inheritance is both cultural and, and, um, and there is a fight over inheritance actually from the mother. 
um, between two sisters, between two sisters, and, and Imelda is the keeper of the flame. She's the pious one who's always making speeches, and uh, Carmel has her doubts. Anyway, Imelda gets the house, and um, plot spoiler, Carmel just loses it completely, and they have a very silly fight. So, I mean, the reason it's silly is because they're, they're, they're not very good at fighting. I mean, if you look at fights in the street or whatever, they're very chaotic. They don't, they're not like fights in a ring. They're not like, uh, they're not like stage or, or professional fights. They're just chaotic. Anyway, this is in a living room. And I was, I was reading Carmel in the audiobook, and I found it kind of funny. And I think the producer was a little bit... Uh, to, taken aback, because they are so furious, but they're not doing it very well, and they're and they're doing it in complete silence. And the funny thing is that is if they were five and five, five years old, it would be completely normal for siblings to do it. But they, these are women in their thirties, and it's just outrageous. There's also quite a powerful scene where um, Carmel and Nell fight, and. Um, uh, I found that a really interesting depiction of what a mother, um, uh, what a parent might experience looking at their child who has kind of done something wrong, but they're also a child who hasn't really done that much wrong at all. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, looking at the child, so what? Oh, just, just the, the musing on um, uh, kind of uh, violence and disagreements with it within a family uh, and how you put that on the reader. So, you know, we experience it as we pick up the wren, the wren. Sure, yeah, I mean, I'm really interested in making the reader um, identify with morally complicated situations um, because it, it, is, it can be unsettling, um, and I know that, but I've, I've been doing it all my writing life. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, we identify with Carmel, who, who may not even be a likable character. There's one throwaway line where she loses two personal assistants in her office in, in, a, in a year, and one of them says, you're a complete fucking thug. <laughs> it's just there, you know, but we're on Carmel's side, you know? Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so I mean, Carmen has a tough, a tough, a tough road to, to tough furrow, turf. Anyway, a tough, tough road to hoe. A tough road to hoe. Yeah. There is a um, scene. Oh, sorry. So we admire her for keeping it together, or we're with on board with her in some way. And then, and and, and of all the things that she, that would hurt her most, are her actions towards her child in that scene. So that is when she becomes kind of tragic. There is a scene where Carmel is remembering Saturday mornings with her dad. And the um, fear might be too strong a word, correct me if I'm um, going too far, Anne, but the, the discomfort in the household when the Saturday reviews would come out. And they might be positive or they might be negative, but you know it wasn't particularly nice um, if they were negative and Phil might storm out or whatnot. And I wanted to... Uh, go from your fiction to yourself, Anne, how do you feel um, about people who talk about your books and, you know, print, print reviews about them, but also what that means? You know, why is it useful or not to critique? To what? To critique, to be critiqued. So, yeah, Phil reads the Irish Times on a Saturday and, and, and just goes, you know, you stay out of his way. <laughs> and his children... So, he, uh, so he, he just stomps about a bit. And it's not because he's been badly reviewed, but because it's all wrong. Um, Austin Clark is at the top of the page. He's an Irish poet, and he seemed to be in charge of Irish poetry in the Irish Times for about 10 years. So he'd have a grand opinion. He'd hand it down. It would be completely uh, annoying to all the writers in, in Ireland. Uh, and that was the game. Um, so, uh, uh, and the kids would get a clatter upside the back of the head. That, 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 that. Uh, and Carmel thinks it, it was like the weather. So if it was your own fault if you got in the way. Mm -hmm. So that it's your own fault if you get in the way. That was very typical of Ireland in the 1970s. And it's very typical of the kind of mentality of Carmel these, these days, that if there's something wrong with you, it's also your own fault. So there was always a throwing back on the weak. Uh, the fault was always thrown back on the weak, you know, and that mechanism uh, it, it deserves, you know, recognition. 
of, of where the fault gets, gets placed. Um, so about, yeah, I don't know, I've been writing for ma many years now. There was, when I started out, um, the, a, a much more uh, authoritarian uh, critical culture. Um, and there were critics in those days who were just nasty. I mean, they were so nasty. And they enjoyed it. And not only did they enjoy it, but the, the, all the, the Irish middle classes also enjoyed it on a Saturday morning. There's nothing like a good hatchet job. Um, you know, just so there was a kind of a culture of a, a kind of narcissistic culture of envy, put it that mm. way, that the narcissism and the envy were of a piece there. Um, so, you, so it was frightening enough within that, uh, within that small place. Uh, but Irish writers have always written for everywhere. They've always escaped, the words have escaped what might be that small, that small kind of that attempt to keep them in their place somehow, which was below below the critic. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd be reviewed in many other places as well. Um, and then, you know, maybe 20 years into my writing career, a great democratization of the critical culture happened because the internet introduced the reader's reviews and that complicated things wonderfully. It also feminized the critical space um, and, and importance moved around and the feeling of importance got a little bit unpacked um, uh, 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 and, of course, the publishing in industry was very alert to it. Now, you don't want to privilege TikTok, which is now currently a place that sells books, apparently. Do your books sell on TikTok? I have no I idea, actually, about that. I don't know. You see, I mean, for two minutes, everyone thought that Twitter sold books, and then for the next two minutes, they thought that Instagram sold books, and now they think that TikTok sells books. So who knows? A moment ago, you said um, kind of the importance moved around, and you were referring to, to criticism. Um, but you know, while you're here on stage and being so generous with us, and I want to unpick that a little bit more. I don't mean what do you think of yourself in terms of international literature, but I do want to like. Do you feel more confident? Do you feel that you can intervene in um, you know discussions about literature, whether it comes from Ireland or anywhere in the world? Do you feel like so? One of the things I realised, I mean, maybe I don't know how many books in was that that as a reviewer I could make people, uh, I could help establish uh, newer voices, and so I reviewed a series of younger or newer uh, voice, female voices in the places like The Guardian, um, which is a powerful, it's a powerful space. So um, I also, when, when, you know, some would, would support, I just support writers who I know are going to catch a, a wind of, of, of unpleasantness. <laughs> I, I, I get in there early sometimes to say, everyone has to get over themselves now. This is a good book. <laughs> I like that. We have a question following on um, from what you just said from Anonymous. Yeah, sorry, also, go please go. Yeah. Anyway, but, I, um, but part of the reason I do that is because there was no one to do that for me. There just wasn't somebody who could say, well, I'm very important and I like this book. So I, I can now huff to you and say, now I'm terribly important and this is an important, we, we all have to take <laughs> Yeah. That just the clap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it does link to the question from Anonymous. Um, with the prevalence of Irish literature around the world at the moment, how do you feel the literary scene, particularly in Ireland, has changed since your debut? The, the literacy? Oh, no, the literary, literary scene. scene. Oh, well, I've been around forever now. <laughs> we still care. <laughs> so it's changed utterly. It's very incredibly lively. It's uh, Ireland, Dublin. People come now to Dublin to write their books. I think I actually met somebody who thought that you could sit in a pub and do it. <laughs> <laughs> that that's how it was done. You came to Dublin, you sat in a Dublin pub, and you wrote a book. So that didn't work. <laughs> um, but but the the scene is incredibly lively, um, and there are literary journals that have been there for ten. 15 years, um, mm. both for fiction and non-fiction, The Stinging Fly and the Dublin Review. Um, uh, and I, I went to a 
a launch of a book by Colin Barrett in Hodges Figures recently, which is a bookshop in the centre of Dublin. And I realised I've been going into Hodges Figures for just amazing books that go everywhere. And you're in a room with lots of very accomplished uh, Irish voices that are going to you know, win the prizes or not win the prizes, if that's one, in one kind of arena, or that are just going to do very well. Yeah. It's very exciting. And then everyone goes to the pub. So, I mean, it still works. It is exciting. It's still exciting. That is wonderful. It is, yeah. I don't know how they all get on. I'm sure they don't all get on. Well, they get on at the start. <laughs> when they're starting out, there's a kind of feeling of we're all in it together. Yeah. Now, you were the first um, uh, laureate for Irish fiction. Ireland, um, you know, has previously had, had laureates, but to be a laureate of fiction w was new um, at the time in 2015. Um, you know, speaking here in Australia, we don't have a tradition of laureates of any form, although I should say that the new national um, arts policy does suggest that we are going to get a poet laureate. But I would like to ask you, as a former laureate, practically what does that involve? But also, more importantly, what does it mean? Um, Oh, I don't, I don't know what anything means, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I mean, but, uh, it, it's a three-year post, so it's been taken on by Sebastian Barry and Colin Trevine since, and uh, everybody does it differently, so, um, but you're required to write three lectures a year, and you do some teaching, so, but, but usually it means just a kind of heightened version of what happens anyway, which is this kind of very strange and, and in tr you know, gr really interesting collegiality uh, 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 of Irish letters that, you know, they're, they're, you keep the conversation going. So, when, you know, interviewing other writers and bringing them along. But uh, one of the lectures I did, now this is 2016, and you would have thought that it had all been done and dusted by then, but I realised that the gender imbalance in reviewing culture had gone completely unchallenged in Irish letters. And so I did, I, uh, you know, hired a researcher and did all the statistics and read the Riot Act on that. It's really interesting mm -hmm. how a culture that sees itself as one way might, might not recognise how gendered that, that can become. And for not for any grand reason, uh, because, you know, everybody... Everybody in 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 uh, everybody's working too hard, you know. <laughs> I mean, I know there's no mag mag magus figure sitting over everything and making a big judgment that a culture is made also of incompetencies. Mm. Um, it's just generally what happens, how 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 things fall out, and when that is the case, it falls out male. So unless you keep an eye, unless you make an effort. Um, and in the middle, there's all that stupid, shouty, roary conversation about why would you and what that, you know. So, um, so there, that, that didn't happen in Ireland because, in part, because the statistics weren't an argument. I, I found it really difficult to do mm -hmm. because part of the problem of being a woman writer was that you had to spend so much time being a woman writer. And the, and the men were writing their books. Meanwhile, you have to make in the art, you have to make arguments or, you know, uh, uh, and you have to be described as a woman all the time. And then you have to think about what that means and start talking about it. And they're talking about their books. Yeah. I absolutely wanted to be a writer who could just talk about my books. But particularly in my, mi my middle years, my 50s, I realized that nothing was going to happen unless I, I actually grasped this some way. I was just so astonishingly fed up of, of people literally ringing me up and saying, we forgot to have a woman on the panel. I mean, literally, you know, I was at my height of my insult, grievance, <laughs> at a pitch. Like, if you call me a woman one more time. <laughs> um, and it was just such a full-time job. Uh, but in my early years, the, the only woman on the panel, there could only be one woman at a time. That was the other thing. So people would say, oh, she's doing very well. <laughs> like they couldn't, <laughs> you know, like they, they, that if that woman, uh, that other Irish woman is doing well, you can't be, do you can't, you can't be doing well. Because <laughs> there can't be two women. There's only one woman any, at a time. Um, 
a lot of, a lot of nonsense, really. Mm. So, so I mean, that was about uh, what? No, no longer the case. I mean, by the time I read the Riot Act, uh, it was all, you know, the, 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 it was over. And it's really interesting where, where history comes to a point, I call it history, where change is at a point beyond itself. Do you know what I mean? Where it's already happening underneath and you just have to call it. That, that change, that there's a kind of resistance. You could call that kind of, that, that, that monoculture of masculinity was a resistance to the reality of what was happening in publishing and reading at the time. Given what you just said and, and the changes that you know um, have have occurred, how do you think young Anne Enright would experience now if you were starting your debut, your, your career now? Well, that's a very interesting question. I, th I think on one level, I'd be exactly the same as I was. I mean, for sure. Somehow, the relationship to the my relationship to the page hasn't changed. Um, and my relationship to language hasn't changed, and there is an urgency about about my uh, life at the desk that actually hasn't changed all that much. It's just got a bit kind of more anxious, but or less anxious. Sorry. <laughs> Woo. Um, but uh, if I was starting out now, I would be online all the time. Hmm. I would know exactly who was doing what, where, how, how every book was doing. Um, I would not have had, I would be a less original uh, starting voice because I would cut my cloth somehow to do well in a known, a known world uh, or one that could be assimilated or could be strategized or something. Mm. Because I, I wrote many books without the sense of anyone reading them. Or, I mean, they weren't reviewed in Ireland, the first, uh, the early books. So, um, or they were reviewed far away. So there was a real kind of privacy to that. And there, there isn't anymore. Have you seen that happen to um, kind of new writers now? That idea that they're a little bit bland or a little bit more? I don't know about bland. I mean, uh, because I was just judging for the Sunday Times in the UK, the Young Writers Award. Uh, uh, so I read a lot of fiction under 35 this year, um, and it's incredibly accomplished. It's incredibly well shaped. Um, so that match between the internal urge to write and the external way of shaping the book and marketing the book is actually, it, it, you know, they're very polished. They, it, it ha and it, I don't know if they've lost originality. It's, it, it's like they know what their identities are. Well, I, I, had, I had no idea of, I had no, I had no conversation about identity um, in my, I still don't. Um, <laughs> it, it's not, you know what I mean? It, so, so everything in my work seems to come from the inside. Mm. It, it's somehow still. Um, shortly before you mentioned this urgency that you find at the desk and maybe less anxious now, but were you to, once you get home, will you find that urgency to sit down yeah, and... Yeah, yeah. Don't ask me that. I'm not like, okay. <laughs> well, I, 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 will, I will respect that. And um, <laughs> there are many um, anonymous questions coming here. I think they're all from different I anonymous... I left my computer in, in Ireland. Oh, you got a break. For the first time in my life, I'm, I'm yeah. without my computer. So I'm fiddling about my phone, but I'm not writing on a phone. I think I might take it and buy a notebook. Ooh, definitely buy a notebook. <laughs> I think the State Library can sell you a notebook. Um, there is a question here. Um, did you mentor Claire Keegan? Talking did, did I what? Mentor Claire Keegan. No, I did not, no. Well, there's the answer, anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, she is very much her own person, yeah. Uh, and she teaches as well. She does weekends. She does weekend workshops, yeah. Is men's resistance to reading women's authors because they show up men for their sexism and violence? I don't know. You'd have to ask them. And, and the thing is that the kind of man who doesn't read women is not able to answer the question. Mm. Mm. So it's a kind of self-enclosed problem. There are... Now, this is not asking you about your next work, so I'm, I'm not going back there. What men say who don't read women, they say they're not any good. 
them. Uh, I think V.S. Naipaul said he couldn't read women because they just weren't any good. Mm. <laughs> That's Sorry. what they'll say. But what that unease is, uh, is not for me to, you know. Yeah, no. We've had a few questions about the process. Uh -huh. So not your next book, not, not putting pressure there, but in terms of, um, you know, how do you do it? How do you sit down? What makes it work for you? So um, the bad news is I just work all the time. So, <laughs> so the question, do you work in the morning or the afternoon, is moot. You know, there are sometimes I work also at night. Um, and I think the thing I have to learn how to do is to stop working at around mm -hmm. 3 o'clock. That's probably the thing I have to do. Um, but that's only when the book is going. I mean, in the second or third year of writing a book is utterly, I mean, just amazingly. Uh, I love that time when the book starts to come together. There is, there's, a, there's a middle phase where you don't quite know where you are and you're not getting it and you're, it's nearly there, it's around the corner. It's, mm. If you look here, maybe you push that, you know. Um, and then at some moment there is a kind of structural moment and you know you're writing the book, the book, the finished book, it's there, it's, it's some, and that is absolutely uh, wonderful. I don't know how many more times I'm going to have it in my, in my, in my life, but I mean the last two books I've just been so completely grateful for those, those months, those last months when the book is coming together, it's just, I love it. So, um, I suppose on, on when, when it's not happening, then I'm not, re I'm probably just reading the papers, really. <laughs> <laughs> Pretending to work. Reading the reviews. Mm. <laughs> you wrote the poem, The Ren the Ren, um, you know, uh, during um, the lockdowns that you experienced. Many writers didn't write during that time. Um, obviously, you have come up with a beautiful book throughout and from that experience. I have a broad question. Would you ever, or can you see a time when writers try to put that experience into the fiction itself? That's very technically difficult. I mean, there are technical difficulties um, that, that that book uh, embraces. One is the internet. Um, so I, my students, I teach in, in UCD, and, and the students might say, or oh, there was a conversation about why the internet wasn't in books, and they said it doesn't really work in books. It's like what the mobile phone did for the thriller. If they have a mobile, then it wouldn't have happened because the information, so much of, of writing novels is about revealing the information later on. So now the information is all there all the time. What do you do? How do you plot? Um, and uh, some students say, well, I can't put the internet in my book because I can't do emails in my book because Sally Rooney did that and Patricia Lockwood did it. And I said that there were more than two people online <laughs> in the world. Um, so what are you going to do? So what I did was I made the on-screen life just part of the stream of Nell's consciousness. So you don't really know that she's online or offline, neither, neither, neither does she. There's no threshold. There's no sense of portals or... Or, or passwords, or clicking about. She's just thinking, and there it is, and there it is, and there it is, and there it, it's, it's, it's not location specific to her, her, her way of thinking. So that's a technical challenge, and, and, and that was my response to it. Um, the, the lockdown is another technical challenge. I um, timelined this book to end in, in 2019. Handy so <laughs> I avoided it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it can be done? Well, sh well why not? Uh, why not? What, 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 what is it that needs to be done? Oh, not for me to say. I'm just generally interested in... Can um, you put the lockdown in a book? Yeah. I remember I, I was, had the amazing privilege to be in Berlin uh, the week after the wall fell. And, it, you know, oh, it's just astonishing. You look, everyone thought we were so badly dressed, they thought we were East Berliners, and we said, no. <laughs> No, we're Irish, and they went, ah, Irish, Irish. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Ireland has changed since then, but, uh, so, uh, but I remember looking at the faces in the streets, and you could identify who the East Berliners were, maybe they were other Irish people, and, uh, and you 
and I was hugely convinced that the great novelist, of the greatest novelist, was walking those streets because this great event would produce a great book. Now, I don't think we've seen the Berlin Wall book. Um, it takes you a long time to incorporate shifts. I mean, the internet is a shift in thinking, uh, never mind a shift in borders. Um, or physical, physical change of the lockdown. Um, but books are, you know, novels are intensely personal and characters live through things. So there's no, there's absolutely no reason that you wouldn't have the lockdown. Mm. I think Ian McEwan had it in lessons, did he? A few, a few people have just, just, just rolled with it, that happened. Especially if they're interested in, in, in the movement of in the in changing times. There is a question from the audience, and I confess I don't have um, any backstory to this, but have the recent constitutional amendments affected your writing and the literary scene in Ireland? Has there been one I've missed? I think I missed a, a referendum recently. Uh, um, uh, about, uh, which constitutional amendment? We, we have them on a semi-regular basis. Uh, th there's no further Is information. Is this the uh, amendment to the eighth, uh, the, 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 the abortion referendum, perhaps? The which? Oh, the women thing. That was always a hoot. Yeah, I have, you know, I'm, re I'm really trying to get interested in all that. Yeah, in the, in, the, in the original Irish constitution said that the place of women in the home was precious and had to be protected. They didn't pay us. <laughs> oh, that was one way of protecting them. <laughs> I mean, there was ne I mean, nobody ever acted on it in any way. I think there was, um, I think there was the, the, the children's allowance. I mean, that, and that made a difference to a lot of, a lot of women's mm. lives. And it made it specifically because the money was paid to the mother uh, and not the father. So that really shifted the, the finances and people really could, if they had a bit of money, they could let it build up and do something with it. But you could, it, it gave mothers that, that kind of um, microfinancing for mothers, which um, is now a strategy used in global aid. But um, yeah, no, I, I oh, can't care. You know, those big ideas, don't, you know, that never meant anything. I find it hard to get agitated about. Sorry, I should think about this more carefully. Sometimes you ask questions that you really haven't researched, so I should, I should do my citizen's duty, and I will do my citizen's duty, and think about this more properly and, and vote. But there is a level, but I mean that really seriously about voting, because there's a level on which people are expected to have opinions, or people have opinions, and, I, and I'm very uh, in favour of cit citizenship as opposed to um, Twitter. <laughs> um, you know that, that that's actually what I that's that's what I am as an Irish person. I'm somebody with a vote, rather than somebody with a grand idea about the constitution. So I will look it up I, uh, uh, in in time. Thank you for that considered response. And I have a final question for you. You have written many novels. You have traveled the world and you are obviously now in Australia. You've been to Adelaide, you've been to New Zealand, not Australia, but close. Um, you're here. Do you get different responses from an Australian audience or your Australian readers than, I don't know, America or anywhere else? Yeah, I mean, the Australian audience is great. I really, <laughs> it is great. It's a great audience, um, great readership. Um, they, I find, it, because I've come a few times, that, that loyalty is rewarded by the Australian uh, readership. That is lovely. Can we have a round of applause for Anne Enright? Thank you, Astrid. Thank you. Thank you. You're getting good applause. <laughs> so. As I'm sure you know, there are copies of, signed copies of Anne's books that will be available just through this hall. Um, the, the bar will also still be open if you would like to avail yourself of that. Um, I would like to thank everybody here tonight, but I would especially like to thank the library itself. Um, it is such a wonderful pleasure to uh, live near 
a library that does this for us. Thank you all very much for tonight. And thank, thank you. you, Anne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's your copy. Oh, yes, yes.